Zoom and four people in the room and more coming maybe. So we'll leave the door open for a little bit. All right, well, let's go around the room in person and have everybody introduce themselves. And then we'll go to folks uh, that are on Zoom. All right, is, is the uh, camera moving towards me? Okay, we'll start here. It is. Um, I'm Leslie, I work for uh, the Crawford Area Transportation Authority in Hayville. Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to say anything else, or are you, are you going to be working on some grants coming up or any uh, capital um, projects? Well, I just got promoted to planning specialist and I'm not really sure what that is. <laughs> Congratulations. You're so getting a lot of information. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What's your name again? Leslie. Leslie. Okay, great. Hey. I'm Heather Dock. I'm with Still Valley Transit Authority in Ohio. I'm the transit planner and account. Good afternoon. I'm Tim Turner. I'm the transit manager for the Steel Valley Regional Transit Authority in Ohio. All right, great. Thank you. And you guys already kind of introduced yourself, but yeah. I'm um, Dana from First Transit. Um, I'm actually located in Horse Central, New York, and I do the contracts and grants ministry for there. I'm fairly new to that as well. Thank you, Street Team. Thanks for joining us. George Levitsky from Fairmont West, Virginia. Oh, hello, Mr. George Levitsky. Hey, there it is. Hello, We'll leave the door open for a little bit more and see if anyone comes in, but that's the room right now. And um, I don't think uh, if you're on if you're on Zoom, you can type a little introduction in the chat if you'd like to. Thanks, so Renee. Have, yep, Renee from Dutchess County Public Transit in Quincy, New York. Welcome. Anyone else online want to introduce themselves? Sam, okay. Idaho DOT or Transportation Department. Awesome. Hi, Sam. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to introduce myself again for those who were not in the last session. My name is Misha Casebeer, and I'm the president of MG Tech Writing LLC. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that here in what is now known as the city of Erie, Pennsylvania, you find yourselves on the traditional and ancestral lands of indigenous people. Currently, there are no federal or state recognized tribes in Pennsylvania because of centuries of violence, genocide, disease, and forced removal. Nonetheless, indigenous people live throughout the Commonwealth today. The history of the native peoples whose land is now occupied as Pennsylvania and those who have later come to Pennsylvania, we honor every day. So the mission of my firm, MG Tech Writing LLC, is to promote community health, wellness, and economic development through provision of multimodal transportation planning, professional grant and technical writing, and uniquely customized training and technical assistance services with a special focus on transportation related program development and technical assistance for rural and tribal communities. In seeking to achieve that mission, I recognize support and advocate for the sovereignty of the native nations in this region and beyond. By offering this land acknowledgement, I wish to again affirm tribal sovereignty and my ongoing commitment to holding myself and my firm accountable to native American peoples and nations. So this is a, an overview of grant writing, and we are going to do some writing practice. And the purpose of this, and not covering in detail a whole bunch of bipartisan infrastructure FTA grants, is because there's a fire hose on right now of grant funding. And so if you are in a grants and contracts position or you are writing grants right now, it's a little overwhelming because every single day you're getting something in your inbox 
And I will say this about the federal government. In my lifetime, I've never seen them move this fast. So it's pretty amazing. And it's, it's really a neat opportunity. However, after writing grants for 30 years, one of the things that I began to develop many years ago were some different tips and, and tricks for um, trying to manage the flow and also have a life. Um, and so that's why we're gonna be talking more generally about grant writing and not so specifically about FTA grants uh, because I want you to walk out of here with some tools that you can use to deal with the fire hose of volume of funding that is coming along. So really grant writing can be fun. Uh, it is something that, as I said, I've done for over 30 years. And um, I would say this, every time I do it, I learn something new. And the cool thing about grant writing is that it forces you to really learn to be on the side of who the review panel is. You have to become that person and try to adopt their level of knowledge in order to write to them. So I introduced myself. And uh, again, if you're joining us online, please put your information in the chat uh, as to who you are and from whence you are joining us. And we will continue. Uh, we did introduce ourselves. And so I will go on past this. Do we have anybody that's from a tribal transit agency? I did see that Seneca Nation was supposed to be attending this conference. Um, and do any of you represent nonprofit organizations? Okay, thank you. And I don't think you introduced yourself. Would you like to introduce yourself? There's a mic right there, kind of in front of you. I don't want to put you on the spot if you want to be shy. <laughs> My name's Marlena. I'm with the United Coalition, which is a nonprofit based in Okay. Could you hear her? Yeah, it was a little hard to hear, so I'm not sure if our people online heard, but do you want to share kind of your connection to transit and why you're interested in joining us today? Yeah. <laughs> I think with Bill, you have to talk like, yeah, like that. No. There we go. There you go. <laughs> so I'm with the mobility manager for the region of rural Southern Nevada. Oh, okay. Our organization is under, under the Nevada DOT. I'm pretty new to this position. I've been with the nonprofit and in that world of grant writing for like nine years. But this is, tra the transportation side is pretty new to me. I stepped into it because every community meeting I've been to, every discussion, every need, food, treatment, there's always transportation. Thanks for sharing. And yes, I would agree with you. Uh, I've been in transportation now since about 2006. I love it. Um, I'm amazed at the overlaps into just about everything we do. Uh, are any of you in the room from a bike share program? I did see a couple people that were registered for the conference from bike share. And you know, bike share is an important opportunity in terms of transit, in terms of broadening the multimodal connectivity from transit to bicycles, pedestrians, and that sort of thing. And so raise your hands. I, you know, some of you introduced yourself and, and talked about the fact that you do grant writing, but how many of you have been writing grants, uh, are currently trying to manage grants uh, that are coming down the pike, uh, just a show of hands. And if you're in the Zoom, uh, you can just indicate with a yes that you've been doing grant writing. Great, okay. So some of this will be things yeah. you've heard and some of this will be new. Um, and we have, Bren has said, Bren Schweitzer has said that yes, he's doing grant writing, great. So what you're gonna learn here today are some basic grant writing terms, several grant research methods, how to match your organization's needs to grant funding opportunities, as well as gathering demographic information, 
building effective partnerships, some budget development basics, drafting SMART objectives, and drafting project abstracts. So what you should have is handouts. There should be three different handouts that you're receiving. A sample grant project abstract, that's a two-page document entitled Main Street Program Abstract, and then a project profile planning worksheet, which has a number of different boxes in white and gray, and then a grant proposal development process, which is a page long summary of the planning, writing and submission phases of grant preparation. And I've had that little handout, the grant proposal development process for many, many years. And I like it because it's quick bullet points and it just shows you kind of uh, from start to finish the kinds of things you need to be thinking of as various steps in the process. So some basic grant writing terms, you know, we're working with the feds and counties and state uh, funding sources, sometimes uh, private corporate foundations and community foundations. And so there's a lot of acronyms out there, of course. RFP, we hear very often requests for proposals. Um, when we're looking at federal government uh, solicitations, typically they say notice of funding opportunity, uh, NOFO, Notice of Availability, that's usually a National Science Foundation, which is an NOA, and um, NOFA, which is Notice of Funding Availability. So what is a grant? Uh, because a lot of people uh, you know, think this is just free money, and that's not exactly what we're talking about here, because free comes with the cost of work and goals and objectives, and reporting and other requirements. So a grant uh, is a financial assistance award in the form of money or property in lieu of money by the federal or state government or a private corporate or community foundation to an eligible grantee. And a grantor of course is the federal or state agency or government or foundation that's providing that funding. Grantee is who you folks are often hoping to be, the agency or organization to which a grant is awarded and which is then accountable for the use of the funds provided. And this comes up a lot in our work, in-kind contributions and match. So the grantee's non-cash contribution uh, is the value and, and in-kind is the value of property, equipment, appreciation, or third-party contributions including services, equipment, or property. So when you see match required, but it doesn't say that it's cash required, then often you can make your match 10%, 20%, whatever the, the grantor is requiring uh, in the form of in-kind contributions. But keep in mind that when you do that, you need to track that just like you're tracking the actual flow of the grant funds. So several grant research methods. So start your search in your own backyard because you may have a metropolitan planning organization, you may have a council of government, you may have a regional planning organization through which funding is being passed through from the federal government or the state government. And you wanna ask yourself what agencies are serving your community because said agencies may have some kinds of grant offerings. Uh, Bank of America offers grants, uh, Walmart offers grants. A lot of corporations, Nike, Coca-Cola, Ford Foundation offer grants, Kellogg Foundation. So, um, you know, and some of those organizations are associated with only granting in a regional location. But look and see what agencies are serving your community, and that might turn you on to some different funding that you hadn't thought about that's not coming from the federal, state government, or county government. So look also at what companies, like I named several corporations, who's funded local projects in your area. I'm frequently clipping things out of the newspaper about who's just received grants and who's awarding those grants. It helps me when I'm moving down the road and working with clients to know, hey, I didn't realize this particular grantor or this particular grant funding was available. So look and see who's winning this money in your area. And then read blogs, newsletters, annual reports from agencies and organizations in your field in transit. And I highly recommend, uh, because I'm here as a consultant for the National Rural Transit Assistance Program, we call ourselves the RTAP, 
They have an e-newsletter that comes out every two weeks that lists uh, various blogs, newsletters, and also grant funds. So for example, if you work with nonprofits, they can sign up for here in Arizona, the Arizona Alliance for Nonprofits e-newsletter. In most states, there's a, an alliance or organization of some type that serves nonprofits. And if you don't find it, you might look at some of your state universities because sometimes they have a nonprofit department or wing that uh, is operating in this fashion. Okay. So several different grant research methods continuing this. Research various government regulatory agencies, of course, research known grantors like Federal Tr Transit Administration, read the Federal Register, um, and read the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance, and grants.gov. And you can actually set up an RSS feed right on your toolbar where you get notified of just the grants that you want to be informed about from grants.gov. Also, when I say read the Federal Register, you can read just today scan through the list of departments that are either issuing for comments or uh, are doing some kind of a programmatic change or are announcing grant awards. And there are, uh, there's a daily uh, posting from the Federal Register every single day, sometimes even on Saturdays, um, that lists all this information by federal department. So it is a good thing to track. The CFDA, you begin to read that you know, massive, massive document. You read that when you want to know more particulars about a particular grant that you're interested in, its funding history uh, over the last several years, if it's a new set of funds, um, what are the details, rules, and regulations for it? Over and above what is announced in a NOFO or RFP, because this is the standard language that the federal department is using to talk about this grant generally from year to year. So go where you know there is federal or state money. So example, FTA, um, also USDOT, your state DOTs, and the Federal Highway Administration are typically where you can find money uh, for transportation and or transit projects. And tap your agency funding sources to see where their priorities lie. So as you begin to do this research, you're gonna get a sense of where things are moving. So right now with the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, we see a lot of talk about transportation equity, about uh, climate change, and some initiatives that we haven't heard expressed that you need to be thinking about when you are writing your grants, but also new kinds of ideology that might uh, align very well with these different grants and funds and align very well with who your agency is. So use your search engines, Google and various foundation search engines, um, and then sign up for different grant alerts and automatic grants.gov notifications. And this can help you do the kinds of research that you need to be doing. So I'm talking about foundation funding, and we are typically in transit talking about FTA monies or federal government monies or state DOT monies, but I'm directing you to these funds because, as I said earlier, you know, if you're building a transit facility, um, but FTA won't fund the uh, outfitting of that facility, the accessories of that facility, if you have passengers coming into uh, your facility and there's no benches or place for them to sit, then you need to look for funds that can help you purchase furniture and outfit the building because FTA is going to help you build that building, but it won't necessarily help you do the interior of said facility. So these two foundation websites, candid.org, which used to be known as the Foundation Center for many, 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 many decades, and then Chronicle of Philanthropy at philanthropy.com are great sites to begin to do some research for foundation funding. Again, corporate, private, uh, and community foundation funding. And most states have a state, you know, Arizona Community Foundation, Pennsylvania Community Foundation, New York Community Foundation. So look for those foundations because they're large scale and they're gonna be issuing grants across your uh, state. 
And so these, uh, these searches, you can see these two that I've listed up, up top, uh, have both subscription services that you can subscribe to and pay for, but also free opportunities that you can use to search on their websites. And there's many other sites that you can join with a subscription and a fee, or also just check them out for free. Now, free is my favorite word, so I don't pay for subscriptions, um, but I have amassed many years of looking for these things. State universities also have websites that can provide opportunities for research and funding. Um, so for example, this is Wisconsin. They have a grants library. They've been up for decades at that same email address. And so look into see what your state university may have. And typically what you're gonna see there are more things like training programs for your transit staff. So when you're doing grant writing, the most important thing to remember is you don't want to seek it because it came in your inbox. You don't want to seek it necessarily because it's the latest thing out. You want to have some kind of a strategy because as I said, there is a fire hose of money coming at us right now. And if you don't have this plan of action that's designed to achieve a major aim or goal, whether that aim is to buy some new transit buses, to uh, enhance your staff, to build a transit facility, you need to have a plan of action so you're not just trying to chase all around everything that comes in your inbox. It is not possible to do that. So your grant seeking needs to be really directed by your goals. So you need to ask yourself several questions. What kinds of projects, if we get them funded, hit the target of what our transit mission or our organization's mission is about? And so which funders want projects like that? And then you know who to begin to research. And then the question for you in writing this is can you show this funder how your goals align with theirs? So when you're evaluating opportunities to apply, you need to ask yourself, is this opportunity to apply worth your team's effort, creativity, and time? Because the worst thing is to spend, and, and, and you can spend a month, even a couple of months developing a grant application, particularly if it's for a facilities project. And so you need to know that A, you're gonna be competitive and, and B, that all the requirements from the grantor and all the requirements that are gonna be of your time as you're producing this document are worth it. And you have a good shot at getting this grant and not just getting the grant, but running the grant and implementing it well. So then if this is funded, is this new source, source of funding worth managing and reporting? Because some grantors have so many requirements that it's really not worth it for the management for smaller dollars. Um, and so those are considerations to have because the last thing you want is to submit your grant application and it goes straight into the shredder. So carefully read the NOFO, and no, I am not expecting you to read this federal register set of screenshots. This is a notice of funding opportunity for tribal transportation program safety funds um, that was issued back in 2017. But just so that you know what a NOFO looks like if you have not yet looked at a federal register NOFO. And typically uh, you're not, I mean, I don't recommend that you read this once. You read this numerous, numerous times during this grant development process. You're gonna read it once to decide, am I interested? You're gonna read it again to decide your grant management plan for how you're going to start and manage the development of this grant application. You're going to read it again when you are developing the narrative, when you're developing the budget, when you're developing the staffing, when you're developing the evaluation, I suggest you go back and check with the NOFO. And that doesn't mean you have to read the whole thing all over again, but now you're going through and you're reading for certain bullet points that are apropos this particular thing. Because I can promise you, these things are written very intensely, very comprehensively. And each time you read it, you will learn something else and it will stick in your head, oh, I need to hit that point hard as I'm writing this narrative. So building effective partnerships. The power of partners can't be overstated. Coalitions, collaborations, uh, partnerships, networks, this is all important to your process. 
But there's things that to think about and cautions to think about. So coalitions typically are an alliance, usually temporary, of entities. A coalition usually predates the proposal. So it's an organization or set of organizations that have come together prior to you sit, sitting down to write this grant. And coalitions are the loosest alliance term used in proposal writing unless made formal by written agreements. And when we say uh, a written agreement relevant to a grant, we might mean an intergovernmental agreement. We might mean a memoranda of, uh, memorandum of agreement. We might mean a memorandum of understanding. And those are all good documents to have when you develop really formal uh, coalitions and partnerships because everyone needs to understand what their respective role is when these grant funds come down the pike. And this spells it out. And if you include an IGA, an MOU, an MOA in your grant application, then that makes you even more competitive when the funder is reviewing your grant application because they can see that you very carefully thought about the relationship in these partnerships. And they can see that you've built a partnership that's helping to enhance this project and not a bunch of cooks in the kitchen that's gonna slow the works. So collaborations we define as entities working together. So if you mention a collaboration, you want to be sure to explain it in the grant narrative. Uh, again, what are the roles of these different people that are collaborating with you? And why have they been invited to this process? So if there is a nonprofit, why are they part of your transit grant application? What is it they bring to the table and why is it necessary to have both that organization and their staff involved. And so the emphasis is really on this working relationship and the proposal should explain the collaboration's nature and how it's going to benefit the project. So partnerships allow your project to show a larger target population service area and they can show that your project has a greater impact than that which your school, your agency, your organization, your transit um, system might be able to serve on its own. And so that can be a good thing. And that's part of why we build these partnerships to really broaden our reach. And grantors like to see that their money is going far and having great wide service benefit. So partnerships are considered a legal relationship in the world of grants and laws. So when you use this word partner, as opposed to coalition or collaboration, this carries more weight, okay? We talk about partners like marriage. So be very careful because when you partner with somebody on paper legally, it has other implications both financially and as regards participation. So if you don't wanna get uh, that deeply embedded with someone, then maybe you're talking about a coalition or a collaboration and not an actual partnership. And so documents indicating partnerships should be worded very carefully and maybe even reviewed by attorneys and perhaps an IGA, MOU or MOA uh, attached to the grant application to explain those details. Now networks are a newer phenomena in the world of grant writing, probably the newest working relationship and if the writer uses that term, they should explain the network in terms of, is it a new or pre-existing network? Uh, is its purpose, uh, what are the purposes or shared goals of that network? And briefly, how does that network work? So thinking about partners for transit program development, these are some of the potential partners you could have, social equity advocates, private partners, um, if you're a rural community and you're adjacent to uh, or near to a tribal government, tribes have their own funding set aside from FTA for grants. And piggybacking then can expand your service area and create certain overlaps that eliminate gaps that you might have in your service area. Uh, reaching out to schools and school districts, state and federal agencies, existing transit providers, and of course, local and or tribal planners, public health. These are all good potential partners, uh, even if they're not partnering in the actual um, grant administration, 
or grant of implementation, they could be good partners in the sense of providing you some kind of in-kind match, or they might provide you some kind of uh, support letter. And I don't speak so much of support letters. I like to speak of letters of commitment because the difference between uh, you know, another transit agency or uh, your public health service saying, yes, I support this project, and a letter saying, yes, I support this project, and uh, you know, our uh, public health and wellness organization will contribute um, some staff training and uh, some, uh, some lessons about different things about COVID, and uh, will contribute face masks, and will contribute, uh, you know, things that that are needed for prevention of COVID-19. Um, you know, if you spell that out, it's a letter of commitment then, and you get that agency to agree to more uh, than just saying, you know, a blanket statement about yes, and generally support this. And that's making you more competitive. Budget development basics. Um, so I suggest creating a detailed budget worksheet. Now, not every grant requires, and especially foundation grants, don't require a detailed budget worksheet. If you're doing federal forms, the 424A is fairly detailed. But I develop my grants, uh, my grant budgets on a spreadsheet. That way I know the math is right, and I can show a column for a match. I can show the dollars I'm applying for, and I can show the total. And showing that column for match uh, is very important because it shows them that you've made the match that they require and um, or you are providing match they haven't even asked for, which makes you even more competitive. So when you're using the federal form as a guide, you can use that to guide the line items you put on your spreadsheet and then leave room to expand or insert on your spreadsheet other line items. And when you insert the budget, where you insert the budget worksheet depends on the directions in the RFP or the NOFA. So look very carefully for that because some federal grants want a project abstract on top and they want that, that 424A right as the next page. Some want that 424A as the first page. Um, and so be sure that you put it in there uh, right exactly where they say you have to in the order of what they want that grant application to look like because the first thing they do when your proposals come into the agency is look for those to put in the shredder and the circular file, then they don't have to read and get a grant review panel to read as many. So if you mess up on the order, if you don't include a form, if they say don't staple it and you staple it, if they say no notebooks and you send them seven notebooks, you're in trouble right off the top. So again, read and reread these uh, no foes and RFPs. So when you're doing your budget, your spreadsheet, create columns, like I said, for the matching numbers based on what the RFP or NOFO requires. And when you're wrapping up these budget numbers, expect that as you develop the rest of the proposal, this budget may get revisited and revised. And if you end up having to back down, that's okay because you might be able to piggyback some other funding. With all this money coming down the pike, there's no reason you can't write phased grants, phase one, phase two, phase three, with some FTA money, some state DOT money, some foundation money, and piggyback these funds. Um, also, you know, you're going to find, as you get to writing this narrative, that something you initially thought of may not make sense for what they allow, what we call eligible activities that the grantor allows. Be sure to check and recheck your math. If you enter the wrong figure into the spreadsheet, yes, it will add it correctly, but you started with the wrong figure. And don't ever put anything in a budget without an explanation somewhere in the proposal. Now, a lot of these federal grants ask for a budget narrative where you go line by line and tell them what every line item is about. But if they are not asking you for a budget narrative, then you need to find somewhere in the narrative where you are talking about what these costs are. If you are asking for some kind of earth moving equipment, then you need to explain somewhere in the proposal why you need earth moving equipment to build your transit facility. So budget justifications. Budget justifications are also sometimes called budget details, budget rationales, budget narratives, and the name depends on the funding agency. 
And so budget justification formats are usually pretty flexible, but there are also usually page limits because the bulk of your proposal is about your narrative, not just this budget. Um, and so something else about budget justifications is that they give you the opportunity to say why your project needs what things. And then additional uses, these budget justifications provide details or breakdowns of line items, but you can also show the math behind the figures. So we're gonna talk now briefly about drafting project abstracts, and then we're gonna spend some time doing project abstracts and, um, and getting a sense of uh, how to do this. Now, the reason we do project abstracts is um, several fold. The first reason I like doing abstracts is because it forces me to summarize this entire project on a page, two pages, no more than four, um, and cover all these things. Everything you're gonna see in the grant application, they're gonna ask you who you are as an applicant organization and the description of that. They're gonna ask for a need statement. They're gonna ask for your objectives and your goals. They're gonna ask for how you evaluate this project. Who's your staffing? What's your budget? How long is this project? How are you gonna sustain this project, this facility, this set of buses after this money is gone? And then key words, will aid you in researching additional funding. So all of this can be summarized. And so we want this both for ourselves, but also once you have this project abstract in place, you have this great document to shop this grant. So by shop this grant, I mean, if you're chasing people's support letters and you provide them this project abstract, then you don't have to get on the phone and answer a bunch of questions or answer a bunch of emails about what is it you're doing and how do you want me to support and blah, blah, blah. No, it's all there on a page or two pages for them to see, and it helps them develop their letter of commitment for you. Also, these project abstracts, a lot of federal agencies will ask you to write a project abstract that becomes part of your grant application. It might be at the front, it might be at the end, and so now you have, and, and these kinds that I'm going to walk you through are longer than what you're typically be asked for from the federal government. Usually they'll ask you for a paragraph, not more than a page. But in any case, um, now you have this abstract. This abstract then can guide you on developing all these dis different sections of your narrative. If you do your abstract well, then it's easy to build out to 10 pages of narrative, need statement, project objectives, and all that kind of thing. So I provided you a sample. Uh, this is a project abstract I wrote many, many years ago. I used to be the grant uh, coordinator for the town of Pine Top Lakeside in Northeast Arizona. It was a small town um, and we did, we had a program called Main Street that we still have through the state that is uh, basically a, a business uh, assistance kind of program. And so Main Street program at the state level and also local offices make small grants available to communities to help them with economic development, marketing, and that sort of thing. So this was a project that I wrote so that the town could build some monument signs that would guide you into the community of Pine Top Lakeside. And so we were getting the funding from the Main Street program at the state to be able to build these monument signs. So this is just an example of what a project abstract can look like um, and you know, just a sample of, of how I worked at developing one. But before you can write this, you are doing research and more research because your need statement is gonna be all your stuff about population, the demographics of your population, who is it you're serving, um, you know, how many children does your bus serve, how many elderly, uh, you know, what are the health and wellness uh, trip generators? What are your destinations? Um, you know, all these kinds of demographics go into this need statement. Um, you might have to do some research about who your organization is to figure out how to summarize it in a page or less than a page or a paragraph. Um, and then um, the basic idea is to help you summarize your grant 
uh, shortly in a short, concise fashion. So when we're talking about demographics and we're talking about transit, I love this concept that Federal Highways and FTA used uh, going back several years, letters of opportunity, because this is what I love about transit. Transit does so many great things for our community, but one of the things it really does well is it provides these ladders of opportunity for our community members. And so when you're expressing how those ladders of opportunity are gonna work in your community in these grants, you're gonna be talking about age and serving certain ages, serving certain disabled populations, uh, veterans, um, how you uh, are connecting the veterans clinic to people in need of veterans services, um, uh, you know, uh, how you provide a service that helps households that don't have vehicles, how you deal with the remoteness of your rural area by providing a transit service that connects different small communities, et cetera. And, you know, key destinations, what are these trip generators that uh, your transit service helps people get to? So uh, I checked all these links to make sure that they're, uh, they're current and you, know, you will receive a copy of this PowerPoint. Those online have already see, received a copy of this PowerPoint, but um, these are websites for gathering demographics. So obviously the Census Bureau. Annie E. Casey provides great data on counting kids. The Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System provides great data about um, different things kids are experiencing. When are they starting to smoke? When are they starting to use drugs? When are they starting to have sex? Um, and these kinds of things. And uh, you may wonder how that ties into your transit program, but if you are having challenges relevant to teens who are coming onto your buses and acting out, and you are writing a grant to deal with a behavior management kind of thing, then this kind of data can help explain in your county, in your town, in your state, what is going on with these kids and how that might be contributing to the behavior you're seeing on buses or trains. CDC uh, has this Whiskers website. Now this lists injury prevention kinds of things and injuries that areas are experiencing in the United States. And so if you are working on grants for paratransit, um, and or you are writing grants for safety and safety improvements on your buses or your facilities, then being able to cite these injury statistics can be very helpful. Then we go down to USDOT. And the cool thing is that over the last couple of decades, we are getting better at this connection between transportation, health and wellness. And so here you can find this great set of information about this connection between transportation and health indicators. The fatality analysis reporting system, hopefully we're not having any fatalities with our transit programs, but if we have, this is where you can find data from NHTSA uh, and they can tell you in your region uh, down to your community level where these crashes are occurring. And then county health rankings and roadmaps. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these things um, that go into your grant application and that can commonly be misunderstood. We think we understand words like goals and objectives, but from the perspective of a grantor, these are very specific. So what is a goal? A goal is a statement that provides direction toward an intended end. It should always be simple, concise, broad, and include who what and who will be affected. And then focus needs to be on what's going to be achieved. So here's an example. The goal of the Ring of Power project is to provide reasonably priced non-polluting energy to the city of Pancha Villa. So it's broad, but it also has some specifics. The city of Pancha Villa, not just any kind of energy, non-polluting energy. And it's the Ring of Power project's goal. All right, so we're gonna do some practice now. So you have this project profile planning worksheet and you will see a number of boxes. Now these boxes are not numbered, but for the purpose of this exercise, I am gonna speak about these boxes relevant to numbers. So starting at the top, 
the box that says in one sentence, that's box number one, going down to what broad categories of issues, that's box two, et cetera, going down the page. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine boxes. And then if you wanna fill out the bottom, you can. Um, and what we're going to do is rough out the language that would appear in a project abstract. And so we'll spend 10 minutes working on this document. And these worksheets can either describe actual grant projects, things that you are actually working on uh, and that, or that you would like to develop, or they can be completely fictionalized. Um, and I want you to complete boxes one through three and boxes five through nine on the worksheet. Does anyone have any questions? And then when we're finished, we're gonna take a few minutes to share what we've written on our worksheet and answer any questions you might have. So 10 minutes to fill these boxes out. And then uh, we'll take another few minutes to discuss what we came up with.
Okay, your grants are due in about an hour, so you might need to call FedEx or somebody if you don't have your grant application written yet. We got about another 45 seconds, finish up. And if you haven't finished, that's okay. We're gonna go through and talk about these. Okay, so what does anybody think of that exercise? Do you see how that might be helpful? Does anyone have any questions about the document? Any thoughts? Who would like to share their one sentence in the in box number one, what you came up with describing your project? I'll share mine. Okay. Well, I think it could be a little more concise. Um, okay. Provide a shuttle for town residents from Sudbury, the town I live in outside of Boston, Boston to the Framingham commuter rail station uh, to reduce traffic in um, to the station and into Boston, Boston, reducing emissions improving traffic flow and improving mobility and accessibility. Great. Thanks, Liz. Anybody else? George. Uh, Can you hear George? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I want to install solar panels on our main office and garage with the help of the West Virginia Division of Public Transit to help supply energy to the building using a low or no emission grant and help take less from the local grid. So that was Great. the first two. <laughs> Sounds good. OK. Awesome. Anyone else? Anyone online want to share theirs? Renee, <laughs> Brent? Um, what I wanted to do was, uh, in, in one of the locations that I support, I wanted to upgrade the facility, in particular their fuel tanks and bus, bus washer. Um, the fuel tanks, in particular, the environment because of the um, stuff it's emitting into the ground, and um, and the bus washer, of course, is to extend the useful useful life of, life of the buses themselves. So because they get a lot of elements and stuff. Uh, can I can I add to that with just a quick? <laughs> Uh, sure. we, we had just changed out our fuel tanks and because they were over 30 years old, the insurance was nearly 10,000 a year. But when we changed out and put new tanks in, it went down to less than a thousand, just the insurance. Oh, wow. Good to know. Thank you. Thanks, George. All right, anyone over here? <laughs> Wrote something, so you're gonna have to read. <laughs> <laughs> Comes Liz with the mic. <laughs> the Steel Valley RTA developed a strategic plan for the placement of bus shelters throughout the communities it serves, specifically the city of Steubenville, village of Wintersville, and village of Mingo Junction, to provide protection to the elements, especially the rain and snow. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So let's move on then to um, what did what kinds of things did people put in box two? What broad categories of issues or opportunities does your project address? And so using keyword phrases. So what are some keyword phrases that you wrote down? And then can anybody tell me why this is important? Why do we need to put key phrases down? What does that help us with? Kind of use low, low and no emissions, and uh, a local grid. I'm saying. 
right? And why do we care about these key phrases? Maybe they'll get us fun. Gets their attention to your project. Yeah, you you use key phrases that echo the same kind of language that the grantor has issued in their NOFO. But beyond that, when you're doing this project profile planning worksheet, from the planning aspect of it, this helps you think about where to research. So now you can search for funds specifically to those things and or if you're looking for demographic information or research kinds of support for quotes to put in your grant application. These are the kinds of things you can Google. Okay, box three, does anybody have stuff they wanna share in box three? Describe the specific need or issue in your community that your project will address. What does it look like right now? Why is it significant? So for mine, um, there, so I live in a basically a kind of a suburb of Boston and there are commuter rails on either side, kind of like 18 minutes away on either side, but not where I live. And um, there is a, you know, heavily trafficked route into Boston um, that just has very heavy traffic. And there's more, you know, they're building more housing. And so if there was a, um, a way to efficiently get people to those commuter rail stations without adding additional traffic in those areas and parking issues, um, to try to reduce traffic in all areas, but also make it efficient, you know, timing it up to the stations and um, making it easier for commuters. Great, okay. Uh, on, on ours, it would, it would save, you know, tax dollars on uh, spending on electric bills, and it would also help uh, the emissions and, and just learning that this conference so far, West Virginia is pretty bad about uh, admitting things in the air. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Box three. So you see that you're starting to develop your need statement here, right? And box one is your overarching goal. Box two is helping you research. What about box um, five? Again, in our situation, we needed to replace the roof where we are going to put the solar panels because why would you put a solar something new on something that might need to replace real soon? So that's our first uh, step. Okay, great first step. Okay. Anybody else? What are major steps that you need to take to make these changes to, to get to this goal statement you described? Um, for mine, you know, I mean, other than raising the actual money to, to do the project, um, uh, you know, establish an MOU or a contract with, there is a local, uh, like a regional transit authority in the area, but that does not serve the town. Um, so whether we do a contract with them or find a private shuttle company, um, establish the pickup location. So do that through, you know, outreach um, and an option location for parking. Then, um, you know, through the outreach, also selecting the best commuter rail stop times to offer it for, and then marketing evaluation. Sounds good. Anyone else? Box five, major steps. What about box six? What resources will you need to accomplish these steps? For example, people, equipment, training, materials, supplies, services. Well, again, in ours, we'll, um... We're planning on getting the roof done with other uh, non-discretionary funds. 
So we're going to have that done before we actually go after the grant. And uh, so when, once we get it, we will surely need somebody that can install solar, solar, solar panels. Okay. And this is something that when you write your grant, you want to say you've done as a preliminary phase, right? Because when you write a grant application and you show that you're in phase two, as opposed for writing for money to kick off a project, then they already see that you have the, the capacity to complete something. So you're showing increased capacity by saying, we're in phase two, now we're seeking this money to do the next part of this. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Anybody else on resources you need? What about approximating your total cost? Recognizing this is a guesstimate, unless you're already in the process of writing a grant application. Yeah, again, in ours, it's, it's around, just for the solar panel, it, it came in about 120,000, and that has about a 10 year payback. That's excellent. Go solar. Anybody else? Approximate project cost. I left that blank. <laughs> I have, uh, That's why we start with the budget worksheet. I'm sorry. <laughs> Who was speaking? The total project cost is expected to be ten thousand dollars for shelter, shelter, or total project cost of approximately one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Great. Anyone else on cost? All right, what about box A? Who else has a vested interest in working with you as partners on this problem or opportunity? Who are you going to ask for letters of commitment? Well, mine is the, the West Virginia Department of Public Transit. I, and I guess we might have, you know, the city and the county in our area. Okay, great. Anyone else? Who are your partners? Yeah, I was thinking about, um, you know, our state or Commonwealth um, has emissions reduction goals and um, different types of traffic demand or uh, transportation demand management goals. So trying, so having, you know, if the project aligns with those, getting a letter of support or um, ways that it can dovetail with their initiatives and maybe the neighboring cities and towns who it would reduce their traffic so as well as the town itself maybe employers if it increases access to jobs and i'm glad you mentioned that liz because it's something that we often overlook in transit is is talking to our businesses local businesses and um and these folks to help them become partners of ours because you know our provision of transit to their doorstep or to their block or to their area is going to help their economic development and their bottom line and we often don't think to ask those people to be our partners anyone else sam renee are you still with us online do you have any questions anything you want to add um what about box nine? What information tools, data, et cetera, will you use to decide whether your project succeeded? And what are we getting at here? I mentioned it earlier. What do we call this? in the grant application. The grantor is asking for how you are going to evaluate. This is your evaluation strategy. It, it, it's a little confusing to me. Is, is this saying that if you do get to do it or is this before you? you know, when you're, when you're writing, when you're writing this worksheet, um, this is, you know, this is a preliminary step that's a planning step 
that you're using to develop your grant application. So this is you basically roughing out your entire grant application on a page or a couple of pages. So the idea is that you haven't yet done it. But that being said, George, you're talking about going into phase two, right? So, so you're writing from the perspective, you need to be thinking about writing from the perspective of who is this grantor um, and writing to them and writing about this phase two part of the project. So now you're talking about how are you gonna evaluate this phase two part? You've already done phase one. Now this next part, these actual solar panels, you know, what's your evaluation? Well, we asked for 10 panels, we put up 10 panels. We said we'd do it by July 31st, we did it by July 15th. Um, you know, we said that we would hire uh, five contractors to help with us. We got it done with three. Um, we said we'd spend this, we spent that. Do you see what I'm saying? You can set up uh, various markers, either uh, calendar milestones, uh, dollar yeah. amounts, uh, staffing. You know, if we were talking about an education project, then we'd be talking about, you know, how many students uh, now are reading at eighth grade level kind of thing, right? Um, but we're talking about concrete things that we might purchase or build or change. Um, so now we can count a quantity of those things and say, well, we projected it was going to be this much and we spent this much and we projected we'd be done here and we were done on this date. Does that make sense? Yeah, so when we're talking about, go ahead, I'm sorry. I mean, like a graph or something showing you want to have this done by this day, those type of things. Yeah. Right, right. Again, you are speaking to how are you telling them that you can show them you've done this? How do you propose you're going to show them that you accomplished the goal that you cited at the top of this page and the objectives you cited? Now, who can tell me which box is the box that's your objectives? Actually, we're, ta we're talking about box five, because these are your steps, right? So your steps are these outcomes, these, these things that you hope to achieve, these things that you're going to do, these activities. And your M4 is more about the outcomes, the endpoints of what you're going to do and how this, how doing this project is going to make things look different. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody else want to share anything or ask any more questions about um, what they wrote? If not, we'll go on. And we're going to talk about objectives. And so I want you to look at what you put in box four or box five and, and, and think about what I'm about to tell you in terms of how you write objectives. So an objective, different than a goal, is a statement that expresses the intended outcome of your efforts. And completion of the objective will lead to reaching the program goal you cited in box one. Okay, so five characteristics of an objective. Every objective statement should try to meet these five things. It needs to be specific. Who, what, where, how many. It needs to be measurable. What is being measured? It needs to be achievable. In other words, realistic. Can this be accomplished with the available time and resources? In other words, the money that you're asking for. It needs to be relevant. So. Um, you don't want a goal for uh, installing solar panels when the grant you've written is about buying buses, right? So your objectives need to be relevant to the steps needed to uh, install solar panels, not buy buses. And it needs to be time phase, so identifies when the objective will be achieved. So now looking at your objectives, do you see different ways that you can tighten them up? 
and make them more specific to talk about who, make them more specific to talk about what's being measured, um, how it can be achieved, relevant, and time-phased. And it sounds like a lot to put on a couple of sentences, but you can do it and it is important um, to do so. Okay, so now we're gonna take a few minutes and um, write, uh, actually you were right, it was box four, I'm sorry. Box four is the objectives, so forgive me. Um, and, and now go back and fill out box four, thinking about SMART. So I'm gonna go back to that screen of SMART and think about both what you put in box five as steps and box four, what changes do you expect to make in your community or among your clients as a result of this project? What's gonna be different? What are your success indicators? So keeping in mind these SMART things, try to apply those to answering these questions in box four. And we'll take just a few minutes to do that, uh, like five minutes.
Okay, that's not quite five minutes, but let's stop there. So we have the next few minutes. Does anybody want to share what they came up with then for box four? I guess I will. Uh, by having the roof already replaced in phase one, we're ready, would be ready for the panels. And the panels would be set up for easy maintenance. That is creating an energy for running the facility at low or no cost or emissions and will be completed in one year. Nice job, George. All right, so it was specific, it was measurable, it was time phased, it was relevant, achievable. Anybody else? These two pieces to me, goals and objectives, are some of the things that I work on the most in the grant application. It's not that you're not doing a bunch of other research, but everything comes down to these couple of things. Because then when you get the money, these goals you keep in mind and these objectives are what you're working on trying to achieve um, to, to get to the implementation of this project. So it's very important, um, both for the funding of the project that you can express these well, and that um, the funding, the grant review panel can see exactly where you're going with all this. The other thing I wanted to mention that's valuable about project abstracts is if you are working in town government, tribal government, if you are a transit agency, that is operated through your municipality or uh, a larger government under a larger government umbrella, then it's good to attach a council resolution to your grant applications. And so to get on the council agenda to have discussion of this grant application, it's nice to attach a project abstract. Then the council knows exactly what this project is about and is more likely to approve your resolution. Okay, so real quickly, we have a few minutes left. Um, this is the website at FTA where you can find all the information about their bipartisan infrastructure law funding, funding for tribes, um, and all the different kinds of funding opportunities that they have out. So that's the link to this page. They have a special page just dedicated to the bipartisan infrastructure as well they should. And so that you will find at this website at the bottom of this page. And what's cool about this uh, website is that you can see right there kind of in the center, fact sheets. And so these are downloadable two page fact sheets about all the grants they're under offering now under IIJA or what we call bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and so you can, can see uh, real quickly, which uh, grant applications you might want to go after. So that's at this website here. Also on this page is a great video about um, how FDA is approaching implementation of these funds. Here's what these fact sheets look like. So this is just one for the grants for buses and facilities. So you can see that it gives you information about the funding moving forward several years, what kinds of activities, what the program purpose is, who the eligible recipients are. It, you know, these were all published back in January, so we don't have deadlines attached to these, but FTA's website does have a table with all of their grants where you can find those other details about deadlines. Writing FTA grants, when I funded that grant application that I wrote for Craig Tribal Association, I relied on these three FTA circulars. Um, formula grants for rural areas, third-party contracting guidance, and these changes. So these are live links on the bottom of this page. When you get this PowerPoint, you'll be able to click and go directly to any of these circulars. Again, if you can't sleep, they're great reading but they're also great reading for knowing how you need to structure your narrative uh, so that you are meeting the legalese that they require. When you're writing your need statement, you have to remember that these are people that are maybe at the state office, uh, maybe in DC that are doing grant review, 
they may not know what your rural community, what your community looks like. So the purpose in your grant narrative and especially your need statement is to make this picture, draw this picture for them with words, sometimes with photos to help them get an idea of what your local community and local transportation needs and challenges are. And then just some quick tips and tricks. Don't forget to proofread your grant. So this is an actual screenshot of an appendix that I was trying to print for an application. I was a uh, grant application I was writing for the Yavapai Apache Nation. And it came off my printer backwards like this because I'd set my printer up for like book setting where you have mirror pages. So I'm clicking along, you know, printing out my seven copies of whatever grant application. And, and it starts coming off the printer like this. So don't think just because you set it to 10 copies, you don't need to go check the machine, go check the machine. And don't think you have to be this great writer to be a great grant writer. Uh, it's about following directions, dotting I's, crossing T's. Don't forget the small details. Check and recheck the grant requirements. Like I said, read and reread that NOFO. Don't get your grant circular filed because you left something out. Usually they have checklists. Go back, do the checklist, make sure you've got everything in there and use that application preview and application information to make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, let's see, what else? Competitive grant applications. Use aerial or parcel maps of your transit project area using lines or colors to highlight significant transit routes, stops, locations, charts, graphs used throughout the proposal if possible, if allowed. Don't use charts, tables, or graphs that are difficult to read or understand or are blurry. Uh, use color where appropriate and always quote your source of information. I'm gonna not burden you with this, but I will go on to, these are exemplary from grant applications that went to Federal Highway for transportation money. So you can see they're trying to build a short fill here along the road edge and they gave a picture and a diagram. And then here's a location picture. And so if you use photos, it can help people in DC to imagine this very rural area, possibly in Pennsylvania. Always paginate your grant because they get to the grant review table and I have sat on grant review panels, so I know this. And there's you know six 30 page grants you're reviewing and they take it all apart. So if you don't have the page number, it makes the grant review process kind of hard because they don't have a page to say on page eight. See that part of the need statement? That was great. Uh, so always paginate. Use a table of contents, especially if it's a big grant and you have an appendix. Don't anger the grant review committee by using a font so small they can't read it. If you are limited to 20 pages, try to use no smaller than 10. Uh, and oftentimes they'll tell you, you can't use smaller than 12 and they'll tell you, you have to have one inch margins. When allowed use photos, tables, maps, newspaper articles, graphs to help make your case and call that funding source with questions, lots. You're developing a relationship with them. They're about to give you a bunch of money. This develops that trust relationship with that funding source and you get them excited about your project that before it even comes in, they're looking to see your project. These are just some techniques for community engagement. Again, local businesses, tap them for actual grant match, cash. You are providing them a service too. And there's no such thing as failure. If you don't get this grant, then rewrite this thing, submit it again, uh, use this as the foundation for another project. And that's the other good use of these project abstracts. You've now come up with a template. It streamlines your, streamlines your process for other grant applications. Some of that information in your project abstract is not gonna change much from grant to grant. Your applicant organization, who you're staffing might be the same time and time again. So these abstracts can streamline your process. If you don't fund your grant, email the funder to schedule a telephone debrief. Sometimes they'll tell you they don't do that, but the worst you can be told is no. These debriefs will inform you as to how you can strengthen your next application. 
But it's critical that if you take the time to do the debrief, take their advice and then use that to make yourself competitive for the next grant cycle. These are just some categories you might think of researching funding, additional funding for, yes, transit, even arts, culture, and history. Some key funding sources that can provide additional money, public health, human services, community services block grant, USDA rural development grants, FHWA. We're a little over time, so um, if you need to go, um, I'll let you go. If you have any questions, I'm happy to stay another few minutes and answer anything. I hope this was valuable for you today. I thank you for coming out. My apologies again for having gotten this awful cold that I didn't want to fly across the country to Pennsylvania right now. I would rather be in Pennsylvania right now, but um, it's a pleasure to meet you virtually. I don't have a question, but you know, when you talked about that reverse uh, picture that you had, we I sent things to an upholsterer and our, our logo came out in a mirror image. So they had, they were going to buy us all new jackets. And I said, I, I don't want you to go through that extent. So we got it to where they were able to make a patch and cover it, you know, and it, it helped it helped them out from not getting some more patch. But it was funny that it was a mirror image and she, she didn't know how in the heck she did it. That way. I, I have noticed this when sizing things like pictures in my PowerPoint or something, that if you go from something large and you size it down, oftentimes it'll flip it or flip it upside yeah. down. But if you're not paying attention and you're clicking along, you can miss that. So yeah, when you go to print these bunches of copies, there's this big relief. Oh my God, I'm finally printing this thing. But check your printer because you know you can have ink problems, you can have other issues. Anything else? Well, thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Misha. It was uh, really good to have these the handouts to really frame up your project and your proposal. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you everybody. And thank you, Renee and Sam, for joining us. And uh, you should have all the handouts, although we mostly did the, the first worksheet, which was great. Thank you so much, Misha. I hope you feel better and um, save up your energies for, for Flagstaff and um, get back.